Hey, welcome to Kidmount Baptist Church in the lovely community of Kidmount, Ontario, Canada. I came up the other night from the other end of 121 and the lights were all on on the street and back in the parkway and I drove up and checked out our stable and by golly those solar lights were working. It was great to see. We continue our wonderful walk through the Gospel of Luke this morning. We're in Luke chapter 13. And as we walk through this wonderful Gospel, we're, we're taught over and over by Jesus. The big issue in the preaching ministry of Jesus, from the beginning of his ministry, was the kingdom of God. If you remember Luke chapter 4, verse 43, I think it was, he says, I must preach the kingdom of God. Jesus had a must ministry. I've mentioned this to you before. I must do my Father's will. I must preach the kingdom of God. But as we progress through this gospel, we realize that it doesn't look like much of a kingdom. There was so much hope at the beginning, and we're going to see that in these weeks to come as we go into Christmas. You remember the, the announcement by the angels to Elizabeth and, and Zacharias, the announcement to Mary, the announcement to the shepherds, the angels' announcement to the shepherds. And then a little bit later on in Jesus' life, John Baptist, the forerunner of the Messiah, and then one day he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the crowds started coming. The crowds came, and we've seen this right up through the last few chapters. The crowds were huge. But as the months progressed, the leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees, determined in their heart that they were not going to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. They made it very clear. They rejected him totally. Why? Because it threatened their structure. It threatened them. They had to get rid of them. So they spread the fake news, and we've talked about this over and over again. The fake news. And what was the fake news? Well, we can't deny his, his miracles. His power must come from Satan. Not from God, from Satan. So they plotted his death, and of course, we know ultimately they succeeded. It's interesting to me as we study this, and we've seen this, the inner circle of Jesus' followers were the twelve. You know that. This, the chosen really reemphasizes that. It was the twelve. Even one of them was a traitor, as we find out later. And then we got to chapter 10 of Luke, and he chose 70 more disciples. Even after Jesus was resurrected, the Bible tells us when he went back up into Galilee to meet with the disciples again after his resurrection, there was only about 500. Amazing. Before he died, upper room, how many do you think there were? 120. The Bible tells us that. Things weren't happening exactly like the disciples thought they should be happening. And we see that. Jesus talks about the kingdom every day. All these towns and villages, every time, he talks about the kingdom of God. To most, the kingdom was more than internal. And we've seen that. It was external. Trumpets, thrones, armies, horses, palace, and even the disciples were arguing, oh, who's, going to, who's going to sit at your right hand, Jesus, when we're in your kingdom? Remember that? And Jesus, <laughs> masterfully, of course, what was his answer? Can you drink of the cup that I'm going to be drinking of? Talking about the suffering that he's going to have before Calvary. And even when Pilate was interrogating him, he says, are you a king? There was doubt. There was doubt. 
Jesus' response was beautiful again. Hey, my kingdom is not of this world. But what kind of a king is he? He doesn't look like a king. He's got no authority over Israel. He's not a visible king. He's not a, there's no visible kingdom. It's invisible. Even today, Jesus, king? Come on. And as they move towards the cross, it looks, to the disciples, it looks like we've got a disaster on our hands. Our dreams are dying. What happened after Jesus was crucified? They ran away. They ran away. What kind of a king are you? You're just hanging on the cross. What kind of a kingdom is this? It's powerless. It's small. It's got. It's despised. It's rejected. It's weak. And that's what prompted Jesus to give us the reading that we're going to read today. So I want you to turn with me, please, to chapter 13. We're going to start reading at verse 18. <coughs> verse 18, just a few verses today. So Jesus was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden. And it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again Jesus says, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It's like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leaven. Until it was all leaven brief word of prayer. Father, thank you for this word. Give us clearness of thought and mind as we present it for your kingdom's sake. Thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. These were familiar stories to them. Matthew 13 was one of the examples. Small beginnings can end up with big endings, great endings. Tiny little mustard seed, they got this all their lives. The smallest seed, Matthew's account says, the smallest garden seed is the mustard seed. And a little mustard seed can end up becoming a big bush. As a matter of fact, Matthew says it becomes the biggest bush in the garden. Leaven. Back in chapter 12, I think it was verse 1, the bad leaven. That was the hypocrisy leaven. A little bit in the church, a little bit in the surroundings becomes big. The good leaven becomes big too if it's mixed in with the dough. And Jesus is saying here, don't be deceived, guys. Don't be deceived about the power and the influence of the kingdom. And that's what we're talking about here today. Because over 2,000 years later, now, we've seen that bush grow. We've seen the leaven grow, permeate, bubble. They could understand that the kingdom of God was a tiny, little, hidden mustard seed. It was invisible, practically. They understood the, the, the sour dough inside the big flower, so to speak, stuck in the middle of the flower and the dough. What does it mean? Well, let's take a look at it. The two of these indicate, first of all, that there's going to be external power demonstrated by this kingdom. Like the mustard seed, man took it. What did he do? He threw it in the garden. It grew. It tells us it became a bush or a tree. So much so that the birds nested on its branches. Now typically back then and today, the mustard seed, if you let it grow, it'll grow to be about eight feet high. And it can grow to have about a 15 foot diameter. That's a big plant in my garden, my wife's garden. So the bush is so large that birds are now nesting in the bush. These guys understood all this. They understood it. The Greek word actually here for, for that is that the birds would come and nest and they would stay. So it was a permanent nesting. So what's the point for this? Well, the external growth of the kingdom, which is what he's talking about there. Nobody was saying, wow, I see this wonderful big kingdom. That's not what they were saying. 
It's not what they were seeing. There were, there's no resources. There's no money. There's no pot, pomp and circumstance. There's no buildings. There's no nothing. If you go to Luke 17, Jesus is questioned by the Pharisees as to when this king, kingdom of God was coming. Because they couldn't see it. And what did Jesus say? The kingdom of God is within you. It's here, though. It's the redeemed. It's here. These redeemed are under their king. You can't see it, but it's here. It's here. Tiny, small, itsy-bitsy, little mustard seed. Hidden. But it ain't going to stay that way for long. Jesus, of course, was born in a stable for 30 years. He never left his family. He didn't do miracles. He didn't teach a lesson. He was hidden. And then he ministered in towns. He ministered in villages. Three years. He made a few converts. We talked about that. Mostly from the poor folk. And at age 33, he was put on the cross. Died. But he was that seed that fell to the ground and died. John 12, 24, when it dies, it shall bring forth fruit. Doesn't seem to be a kingdom. It's going to have a small beginning, though. But it's going to have a great ending. The second point to keep in mind is when it was planted, it grew. It became a huge bush. So big, these birds nested in it. This is the part the Jews expected. Let's take a moment. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 2. A lot of verses, but I'm only going to read a couple to you. Psalm chapter 2. What did they expect? What did the Jews expect? This is God the Father regarding God the Son. One of the messianic psalms. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. Verse, verse 7. And he said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. That's the king they were looking for. And we've talked about this so many times. They were expecting the Messiah to come and beat off the Romans. You can go to Psalm 72. He's going to be given rule over the earth. Isaiah 54, Isaiah 53, Micah chapter 2, Micah chapter 4, Micah chapter 5. In that day, God is going to set his king on his hill. He's going to conquer the enemies. He's going to gather the remnant of Israel. We learned all about this when we had the prophetic plan of God. He will destroy his enemies and their enemies. But Jesus is saying here, that's not how this starts. It's how it ends. It's how it ends. And if you study prophecy at all, you'll realize that this little passage here is powerful prophecy. Powerful prophecy. And today, as you know, true Christianity is the largest religion on the planet. Guys, you're just seeing the start of this. Think of the mustard seed, how little it is. And we realize that ultimately it culminates. Well, let's let's just see how it how it culminates. Let's go over to Revelation 11. I'll try and stay in it very very briefly. It's hard to stay in Revelation very briefly. If you go to Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, it says, "Then the seventh angel sent, sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world, that's Satan's reign, has become the kingdom of our Lord, of his Christ, and he will reign forever and forever. One more. Revelation 19. You should have this one memorized. If you haven't got it memorized, take it home this afternoon and memorize it. Revelation 19, verse 11. 
And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. And that goes back to chapter 1 when, when John got to see him. And on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself, and he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, that, so that with it he may strike down the nations. That's the one they were looking for. And he will rule with, pardon me, rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's in the future. That's in the future. Meantime, the kingdom continues to grow. Now there's another element to this. The end of verse 19 it says, And the birds of the air nested in its branches. What does that mean? What it means is this. Even people that are not part of the kingdom are going to benefit from the people in the kingdom. They aren't part of the plant. They don't possess the life of the plant. They're not connected to the vine. If you get into John, we see the vine, the branches. But they build their nests in it. The nations of the world, they will find a resting place. Protection, security, blessing. Why? Because of the influence and growth of the true church through the ages. And we've seen that happen throughout the ages. Ladies, you're doing Daniel... Did Daniel, you're doing Daniel, you're going to be doing Daniel for a little while. I think it was chapter 4 when we saw Babylon. What, what had happened to Babylon? Babylon had become beautiful, had become massive. It, it, was, a, it was conquering nation. It had, the, it had benefits galore. And then it was cut down. Verse 13 of chapter 4. A lot of imagery. Some of these nations become so great, they become the protectors, they become the providers, become the providers, they benefit many. If you go to Ezekiel 31, you'll see the same thing with Egypt, you'll see the thing, same thing a verse or two later with, uh, with Assyria. Ezekiel 17 talks about the same imagery, the same imagery of when the Messiah comes and sets up his kingdom. Of course, you'll see that in Daniel. The greatest kingdom ever will be when the Messiah comes back and sets up his kingdom forever. So these guys knew the imagery. They knew the imagery. Ezekiel talks about God the Father planting him on a high hill, on a high mountain. And guys, it's going to be like the Babylonian Empire. It's going to be like the Assyrian Empire. It's going to be like the Egyptian Empire. And it will be the Messianic Empire. Our world, the Western world, is not Christian. Don't, don't, don't even think about that. Certainly not anymore. But Christians have been dominating the Western world for a couple hundred years. Probably the greatest nation in the world as far as peace and security and freedom that we have. And Christians have influenced it for years. Now, of course, we know that is waning today in, in our country. Don't underestimate the power the external growth of the kingdom. But that's the external. And it's going to happen in the future. But I want to look quickly at the second story. The second story here views the kingdom of God not in the external growth, but on its internal influences. Verse 20 says this, and again he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It's like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour, until it was all leaven. Jesus knows these guys are struggling. He knows it. They can't see what's going on. He, it's invisible to them. It doesn't look like a king. This doesn't look like a kingdom. So what does he compare it to? He compares it to leaven. Simple story. They're familiar with this. We've seen it before. You take a huge amount of flour... You mix it together as, as, as dough, and you mix it with a little bit of 
of what? Of fermented dough. They call it leaven. Stick it in. Mix it up. See what happens. And something inside starts to be changing, growing, influencing. Don't underestimate the kingdom of God. You guys may not have much influence over the Pharisees. You guys may not have much influence over the nation Israel. As a matter of fact, <laughs> you're going to see worse things happen. We know ten of, at least 10 of them were martyred. But over time, this lemon, lemon, this leaven is going to permeate the flower. It's going to grow. And of course, the flower is the world. The leaven is the kingdom, which is hidden in the world. These guys are clueless. They can't see it. If you go to Romans 8, and we could, we could go there for quite a while. They don't know, guys, that you're, you're, you're subjects in the kingdom of God. They don't know that you are, you are joint heirs with Messiah himself. They don't know that. They don't know that you are a heavenly citizen. You don't look like a heavenly citizen. They don't know that. You're just sitting at the Swiss chalet like the rest of us on Sunday morning. They can't tell. Why? Because the glorious manifestation of the children of God and the glorious manifestation of the glory of Jesus Christ hasn't happened yet. But it will. It will. You don't see it. But you are influencing the world. How? Through your testimony. Your righteousness. The gospel. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Lives get touched. It's just like the leaven that bubbles, permeates, and makes it grow. The character of the bread is changed by the fermented dough, the leaven. You can't see it, but it's growing. It's growing, and it has been for over 2,000 years. And we get down in the dumpster sometimes because we don't see a lot of results all the time. But folks, around the world today, we are getting more Christianity, true Christianity, more true Christianity. <laughs> and it's mostly in countries that are being persecuted. It's amazing. The stories we're hearing. Incredible. Here's the key points I want you to remember today. The power of the kingdom is extensive. The influence of the kingdom also is still extensive. It's like leaven. It's like leaven. And the flower changes. The flower changes. You can have bad leaven too. I mentioned that already. You want that out of your system. The false teaching. The false teachers. Well, you know, Bruce, I don't, you know, I don't really think that Jesus really is God. Maybe small G God, but I don't think he's really God. Well, Bruce, you know, we're at, we're at, we're at Christmas and I... That word virgin really bothers me. I don't think Mary possibly could be a virgin. There's no way. If you really think it through, she couldn't have been a virgin. And so it begins. And that's the bad leaven. Because once you go there, and you say anything about the scripture that's false in your mind, where do you stop? Because it goes from there to stuff that I couldn't, I never heard of until I was like in, in high school. Like, it wasn't a literal seven days. Oh, it couldn't have been a literal seven days. Well, God said it was a literal seven days. And it goes on and on and on. Leaven can be bad. So, either it's divinely en energized influence or it's satanically, satanically energized influence. And what Jesus is saying here, it's saving, it's sanctified, it's transforming influence. And that's the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Final thought before we transition into communion. The positive influence of the kingdom comes from the inside. It's hidden. It can't be seen. It works on the inside. It transforms people. It ultimately can transform society, and it has. How? By its hidden influences. We don't need and we shouldn't need political power. We don't need and we shouldn't need military power. Because Jesus very clearly said, I will build my church. You be faithful. 
I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Bruce, you do what you've got to do. You preach the word of God every Sunday. Folks, you tell your neighbors, you tell your friends, you spread the seed. That's what we're supposed to be doing. He says, I'll build the church. You do what you're supposed to do. And someday, folks, he is coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. And we're going to be revealed as that glorious manifestation of being children of God. And the whole world's going to see it. The whole world's. And I'm really looking forward to that. But more important to me is the fact that we're actually going to see the glorious manifestation of the glory of Jesus Christ. Never has happened before on this earth. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen in that millennial reign. When he comes back at the end of that seven-year period with his church, that's us. And then we will see that glorious manifestation. And we will reign with him for a thousand years, and then we'll just step right into eternity. It's true. I made a note here to myself to finish off with this. What a glorious calling we have. And what a great ending. What a great ending it's going to be. We're going to sing a song as we enter into our communion time. The guys will come forward in the first verse and set up. I just want to say this this morning as we go to communion. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you don't know him or you're not sure if you know him, if you've never acknowledged your sin, if you've never repented truly of your sin, if you've never embraced him as the only one who can save you because of his death, burial, and resurrection, do it today. Do it today. And the theme of forgiveness, ask him for forgiveness. And he says, I'll forgive you. That's mouth, the mouth of God speaking. I'll forgive you. And you will be part immediately of this kingdom that he's talking about here. He's going to talk more about the kingdom next week. Maybe you need to come up, play for us. Let me just pray first. Father, again, we thank you for your precious word.